All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Blurred Wire. Today we are breaking down Secret Invasion. It just dropped on Wednesday. We got our first episode on Disney Plus. And today with me, for the first episode of Breaking It Down, I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Brian Ingram. Brian, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? What's going on, everybody? Nice to meet you. So very happy to be here. Happy to help my man, Will. So what's going on out there? I hope you guys continue to listen and subscribe. If you haven't, go ahead and hit that button. And let's get it going. Hey, man. Thank you, Brian. What a great introduction. Yeah, so we're over here. Thank you for joining us on the Blurred Wire. Again, we're over here just talking about Secret Invasion. Um, as many people know, it's a story that came out on Disney+. Plus. Um, just dropped this past Wednesday about Nick Fury having to deal with a this rogue faction of scrolls that are trying to take over Earth. Um, now, I've read... Have you ever read the Secret Invasion comics before? No, honestly, I haven't read any of the Marvel comics. I've actually caught up on everything through the movies. Through the movies. Okay, interesting. Okay, okay. So, because Secret Invasion is a storyline that comes directly from the comics. And it's actually a really intense storyline where they start to... Where the scrolls basically do the same thing they're doing in the show take over different government entities and government people. They steal them and harvest their memories, and that way the scrolls can pretend to be them, and then they start manipulating world events. And there was even a run, I can't remember who authored it, but he did a run where the scrolls invaded Wakanda. Let's just say it did not go well for the scrolls. Did not go well for the scrolls when they tried to walk up in Wakanda. So, that was one of my favorite comic storylines ever, so it's cool to see them doing like an adaptation of it. Um, so I guess we'll just start off, what did you think, oh, well, first of all, spoiler alert, it's coming right now, we haven't said anything spoilery yet, but we are reviewing it, we're breaking it down, there are going to be spoilers for this show, so let's just start with your thoughts, Brian, what did you think about the first episode of Secret Invasion? Well, the first thing I really enjoyed was the aspect that they actually made it a spy show. Mm-hmm. All right, if you actually watch it, it's an actual spy film, like if you're going to watch uh, 007, Mission Impossible, uh, you know, The Man from Uncle, anything like that, uh, this show is actually like that, except it has to deal with aliens, so it's not just, you know, uh, humans and this, that, and the other. But my first impression was that they put it together really good. They um, tied a lot of the storyline in, that way you understood with uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D., and then it went to uh, S.W.O.R.D., you know, and Saber. You know, and so uh, a lot of that stuff was explained. You got to find out what was going on with Nick Fury. Uh, if you're Captain Marvel fans, you get to a little bit more information on what happened at the end of that and what was going on. And um, they tied it back in really well, just like Marvel's known to do. So, you know, I was impressed. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I know you mentioned The Man from Uncle. I actually just saw that movie a little bit ago on HBO Max. And I thought it was pretty funny. It was interesting to see Henry Cavill in like a spiral instead of like Superman. But um, yeah, I definitely am getting very, very hardcore spy thriller vibes. It feels like they're trying to go back to Winter Soldier, which of course was one of the best Marvel movies, I think, MCU movies that they've ever released. And it makes a lot of sense because like with Scrolls impersonating people, that's a very espionage centric storyline. So it doesn't it doesn't feel like they have to like overstretch or make it something that it's not. You know what I mean? I agree with you 100%. So I'm really curious to see how the rest rest of it's going to be. You know, we're going to talk about the end of it a little bit later, but that cliffhanger kind of opens thing up like, well, what's going to happen next? You know, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it yet, again, spoilers, but the cliffhanger likely referring to is that at the end, it looks like Gravik, who's going to be the main antagonist leading the Rogue Scrolls, shot uh, Maria Hill. And he was pretending to be Nick Fury. And then he shot her, and that's how he killed her. And that was, it was really surprising because lately I haven't seen Marvel TV shows or anything like be willing to kill off somebody that, like we haven't killed a hero really since Iron Man. No hero has really died since Iron Man. I'm trying to think back to all the movies. Uh, I mean, Shuri lost her mom in Wakanda forever. And then, like, Jane died in Thor Love and Thunder, but, like, she was already gone, and they just brought her back to, like, kill her. So, like, this feels like the first time, like, we've had a character in the MCU get killed, and we've all been, like, kind of blown away by it. Like, just not expecting it, basically. I like that because, in a way, it was something that actually got your attention. Because if it was mm-hmm. somebody random, eh, you wouldn't really care. But Maria Hill's a big, you know, a big part of this. So yeah. when her demise, it actually got your attention on like what's going on, what's gonna happen. 
wonder if we're gonna see her again as a scroll or not you know never yeah. know i know someone i was listening to another podcast that was talking about it and they were like you know when they saw her like bleeding out there they were waiting like okay turn to a scroll turn to a scroll but she wasn't turning and so it's making us think that like that's the real Maria Hill that's dead. And so, you know, with the multiverse, they could find a way to bring her back. People always say that. But I, I personally think that she's just going, this is where her story ended. This is where she died. Based upon the trailers and everything, it kind of looked like Nick Fury was going to die at the end of Secret Invasion. Because all the trailers were saying him saying, like, this is one last time, one last ride. I'm at my wit's end. This is, this is it. This is over. Like, it felt like this was the conclusion to Nick Fury's story. But then they drop the trailer for the Marvels, and Nick Fury is 100% in it. So, like, unless the Marvels, like, somehow takes place before Secret Invasion, Nick Fury's not going to die in this. So, it's interesting that they chose Maria Hill to die, and that they chose to do it so early. That is a good point. That is a good point. I didn't even pick that one up, but that does bring to mind, I wonder when that time frame would actually be, because... Does that come before? Yeah, does it come before or after? How soon after, like Wandavision and all that, did that happen? So, uh, I guess we're gonna be finding out. Hopefully, they'll uh, fix in those holes for us. Yeah, I mean, I know Samuel L. Jackson is one of the. Um, he, you know, he tells me like he. Well, he doesn't tell me. <laughs> he said in interviews and stuff that he loves playing Nick Fury so much that it's not like Samuel L. Jackson is one of the most wealthiest actors in the world, and at this point. It's not even about the money for him. It's not about any of that. He just loves it so much. And if you look at, like, I think he's the highest grossing actor in the entire world. And he's down to just keep playing Nick Fury. And if you think about it, he's the only character in the MCU that we've had since Iron Man still running. Because Tony Stark is gone. We don't interact with Pepper Potts much. Even Happy is kind of written out after No Way Home because Peter doesn't remember. He doesn't remember Peter. Um, there's no one else from the first Iron Man movie that's still in the MCU, still, like, in projects besides Nick Fury. That's Actually, you're actually right. Uh, who was the last person we saw? Uh, Hawkeye? And that was in his episodes a couple before, but he's pretty much gone. He was pretty much passing the bow to old girl. Yeah, right? he was supposed to be, and I thought they were going to do something, like, a little more, like, make him... I kind of thought he was going to die, or, like lose his hearing or go blind or something to where like he can't be hawkeye anymore but i guess he's gonna keep training like kate bishop as it comes along but um yeah for the most part because we know a lot most of the og avengers are have passed on even though like they're still trying to figure out what they want to do with thor and trying to figure out what they want to do with hulk but the three main ones well captain america iron man and black widow have all died um but yeah nick fury is the only guy that's been there since the beginning, and I think he's been in more Marvel movies than anybody, if I'm not mistaken. I think, I gotta, I gotta add it up, but either him or Robert, I think once the Marvels comes out, and if you count, like, TV shows and projects and stuff, I think Nick Fury beats out Robert Downey Jr., but I think it's between the two of them, if they're character, or it might be between Chris Evans. I'm not really sure at this point, but he's one of the top three has, like, been in the most projects, so that's why it kind of seemed like Secret Evasion was going to be the swan song for Samuel L. Jackson and Nick Fury. But like I said, the Marvel's trailer kind of debunked that. But are you counting those appearances to also be the after credits appearances? Because remember, Nick Fury showed up in a couple of movies. I them, mean, to so me, that counts. that counts. I mean, he was in it. Yeah. He had to act for the role. He had to film it, you know? Uh, right. So, yeah, so I guess we'll see. And I also, um, I saw this other thing that was pretty interesting. Because um, I actually really like the actor that plays Talos. Um, him as an actor, Ben Mendelsohn. I actually really like him. I think he's a great actor. He usually plays, like, the villainous business role. Like, if you've seen Star Wars Rogue One, he was in that. If you've seen, even in Batman The Dark Knight Rises, he was playing the guy that was helping Bane take over Bruce Wayne's company. And so it was really interesting, because if I'm not mistaken, I think he's the only person to play in a Marvel, DC, and Star Wars movie. I can't think of anybody else, and I know technically... The Dark Knight Rises wasn't part of the DCEU, but I'm like, I can't, like, there's a lot of people that have done Marvel and Star Wars, a lot of people that have done Marvel and DC, a lot of people that have done Star Wars and DC, but there's not really anybody who's done Marvel, Star Wars, and DC, and Ben Mendelsohn has, like, perfected the trifecta, and I'm like, I got you thinking, like, in a day's like, who else could it be? This is gonna be buggy for the rest of the day.
Yeah, but so far, yeah, no, you're right, man. Like, when I think about that, even you guys are that right. have done both, like, again, Tom Hardy, he played Bane and he played Venom. Yeah. But he's never but been he in Star Wars. Star Wars. Christian Bale, Batman, Gore. Never been in Star Wars. Oh, wow, Crazy. that is right. Yeah. And yeah. your boy who played um, Kylo Ren, he's never been in DC. Nope. But he's about to be in Marvel. So is he supposed to become Reed Richards? I, the, I hear those the rumors. Yeah, that's the rumor. You yeah, know, he's supposed to be Reed. So we're gonna see if he does. Then you know he'll at least do the the two. But yeah, I know we're kind of right. yeah we're kind of getting off topic with it. But how do you feel about him as Reed Richards? I, know I respect tough. him as an actor. I'm not mm-hmm. gonna be upset about that. Um, Kylo Ren wasn't my favorite. Because I'm a Darth Vader fan, so nobody's as OG as him. Yeah. But he didn't do a bad job for what he's supposed to be, a spoiled kid that's in between that don't know what you're calling. He's throwing ten. I mean, it worked, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, I've seen him in a couple of other things, not too shabby. So him playing Reed, possibly, you know what I'm saying? I'm willing to give him a fair shot because he doesn't suck in other areas. Yeah, and to me, I'm like, I feel like I gotta see it to believe it. Like, you know, the fan, like, I didn't see Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, but a lot of people know John Krasinski played Reed Richards in that movie, and a lot of people thought that's where Disney was heading, but I guess they were kind of, like, testing it out to see if they wanted to use him, because that was actually completely came up with by fans. Like, fans just kept pushing it, and Disney just cast him, and he was like, okay, I'll do it, because everyone wants me to. And I thought he did a fine job. I'm just like, I still, like, Adam Driver is just one of those actors who looks perennial, perennially young, like Tom Holland, who's probably never going to look like he's not in high school, even as he approaches his 30s. And so I'm like, to me, like, I don't, like, Reed Richards is like a man in the comics, like a family man. I don't really see, Adam Driver just always kind of looks like he's in his early 20s, and he's probably going to be 40 and look the same way. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't really see it, but I guess, like you said, we got to get the f- benefit of the doubt. And see what happens when we come there. Because, you know, makeup and a hairstyle can do a lot for a person. Yeah, you never know. And like I said, maybe he'll, you know, actors are supposed to play in different roles. I haven't seen him do a different role. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see what that happens. But I guess um, to wrap it up, back to Secret Invasion. Um, there's a lot of theories about, like, where this could go. Um, I had some of my own theories that are probably not going to end up, like, playing out that much. But um, I saw one of them that was... Because the Super Skull is originally a villain of the Fantastic Four. And with all these casting rumors going out, a lot of people aren't sure exactly how the Fantastic Four movie is going to come out. But I once saw this one theory that was saying, what if, you know, all the casting rumors are starting to come out and everything? It's like, what if at the end of Secret Wars, I mean, at the end of Secret Invasion, they find out that the Fantastic Four have been captured by the Skrulls? And they have been holding them captive all this time, and that's why we didn't know about them. And so that will be interesting to see if maybe that's why all the casting rumors are swirling right now, and we'll find out at the end of Secret Invasion, and Disney hasn't revealed it. But, um, yeah, so I guess we'll see. We'll see about that. And then I heard some other theories that were talking about, because remember the conversation between Talos and Nick Fury when he's saying, we've been helping you for years, and it's like, well, scrolls like, they haven't been known to humans, so Fury obviously asked them to keep a secret, and he was like, what if Fury has been using them as, like, shield agents, which would make sense, he's got this alien army who could get him intel from anywhere, because they can be anyone, and he's just been using them, and he's like, yeah, I'll find you a planet, we're gonna find you a planet, we're gonna find you a planet, but Nick Fury, like, he's kind of been, like, procrastinating, if you will, finding them a planet, because... He's got a super spy alien army that he's been using, and we kind of explain how he was so ahead of everything, even though, like, they added the scrolls in later. Like, it doesn't really make sense if you look back at the other movies to be like, Nick Fury had an army of scrolls at his disposal, but still, it would make sense as to why he hasn't found them a planet yet, because secretly, he's like, they're very, very valuable, you know what I mean, in that sense, to keep them here on Earth. And they were like, that could kind of make Nick Fury almost like a villain. Or like, at least he made a wrong decision, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I got you. And I like that 
thought process because uh, I was discussing that earlier. I was like, in my opinion, since uh, that little girl is from Captain Marvel, and they was promising them a new home, a new planet. You know what I'm saying? She took her from her friend who was yep. uh, Monica Rambeau, mm-hmm. right? And uh, supposedly was supposed to find them somewhere. We don't know what's the storyline, but we watched them take into a ship and go off, the little girl. She's back here on Earth. Something went wrong. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's the part that we're missing because Captain Marvel, she was with them trying to find it. And now it looks like, like if they still haven't found a home and they're all here on Earth, then that means she completely abandoned the mission and only came back to Earth when Fury sent out the distress call. And I don't know if that'll tie in at all with the Marvels, but I don't know if she had a falling out with the Skulls or something, but obviously we're missing a key piece of information, um, even between Far From Home and Captain Marvel, because we know in Far From Home they revealed that Nick Fury and Maria were being played by Skrulls. And that's why people were hoping Maria Hill didn't actually die, but it looks like, no, that's her. And then that also begs the question, if Nick Fury had Skrulls, had Talos and another scroll impersonating him and Maria Hill on Earth, why didn't he take Maria Hill in space with him? Like, if he was in space, why did he leave her on Earth and have a scroll impersonate her? Like, why wouldn't he just, why, why would they both be on Earth? Why would they both need to be on Earth? Like, wouldn't it make more sense to have her, if he didn't need her in space, it would make more sense for her to be with him, pretending, with Talos, pretending to be a scroll, so she can make sure that he's actually doing Nick Fury stuff. You know, like, actually acting like Nick Fury. So, I guess we'll probably get explanations to that. Yeah, those are some pretty good points. And those are all questions that I had as well, because it was just a little bit odd. Yeah. Because, like, I'm still... They kind of... Um, I heard a couple of theories about, you know, Nick Fury feeling defeated that after everything that he'd done, somebody like Thanos came here and smacked half the universe, you know, yeah. kind of tore him down as a company needed to leave Earth. There's a, still a lot of questions out there, but so far, Marvel's keeping up with they special sauce because it ain't but six episodes and episode yeah. one started off banging so yeah hopefully episode two and three we can get some a little bit of closure on those questions yeah yeah i've seen um yeah i feel like the uh, the reception to it for the most part is pretty good um i saw that i guess like their title sequence was ai generated and people didn't like that i just thought the title sequence looked weird i wasn't like a fan it kind of took me out of the project, honestly, because I remember sitting there watching it with my wife and being like, what is this title sequence? And then once it started, you know, I was just back into the, the story that we were going through, the espionage story. But I guess people really didn't like that. So I don't know. Maybe Disney will cut it for the next episodes. Who knows? I mean, I, mean, I, I had mixed things. I was like, OK, it's not traditional. But then again, you know, it kind of reminded you of of a movie way back in the day, like in the fifties where everything was blurry and it was funky looking. Yeah. And if they wanting to stick to that kind of spy espionage look, I'm not mad at it. You know, they threw the colors up in there. Correct. Mm-hmm. For what they got going on, but I'm kind of with you. I, I like the whole Marvel thing where you get to see all the little, you know, uh, pictures and everything on what's coming up next. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I think the most interesting thread for me right now is how Nick Fury is going to react to Maria Hill's death, especially because, like, in the Marvel sh- trailer, again, I wish they hadn't released that trailer until after Secret Invasion came out, but I, I don't think they were planning on delaying it to November when they released the trailer. But anyway, because, like, you know, it shows Fury happy, and, like, obviously, he seems like he's over it. Well, I still want to see, like, the angry part, the grief part, and I want to see him, like, take out that rage on an opponent who's clearly superior to him because scrolls are stronger faster and just better than humans so i think it'll be really interesting because again maria hill is probably one of his oldest friends and she saved them from a lot of stuff like she was in winter soldier she was in um age of ultron like she's been a a a smaller part but still a pivotal part of the mcu and so i think uh, it'd be interesting to see other heroes i would love to see like a funeral for her you know what i mean like find a way to honor her um i hope we get to see that and like I said, it's not like I don't want them to bring her back because I don't like her character, but if you're going to kill her, I want them to stick with that decision and let it hit and let us like have to unpack it and be like, man, she's gone, so it'll hit harder and we'll actually fear 
for other characters that could die instead of just being like, oh, they could be brought back. I got you. It's the same kind of effect that happened with, uh, so far, Black Widow. Yeah. She gone, gone. Like, yeah. everybody was hoping something would happen, but she, she dipped before multiverse, so. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? She gone, gone, and everybody still remembers that, so I think that Maria Hill will have the same effect, just like the Tony Stark had the same effect. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting. And people like have, um, have said, like, you know, Natasha could have just come back because they could have just used the stones, went into the multiverse, and plucked a Natasha out of that reality and brought her to ours. And I'm like, that still doesn't work, though, because then that reality lost their Natasha. So she's still going to die over there. You're just going to rob them of her and bring her over here. It's like, it's like with uh, Into the Spider-Verse, what Kingpin wasn't realizing is, like, whatever version that he takes his wife and kids, he's going to rob himself in another multiverse of Vanessa and his kid. And so, like, he didn't even, like, compute that because he was just being selfish. But, like, the Avengers wouldn't take her from another reality because they understand, okay, now she's going to be missing from that reality and they're all going to be just as sad as we were. That doesn't make any sense. So that's why I don't, I don't think the multiverse theory of, like, yeah, just pull one out of the multiverse and bring it to our reality. It doesn't work because the reality you pull it from is still going to be missing their person and it's going to make them very sad yeah that's a very good point to cross over because it's like not the same thing with Gamora remember Gamora came yeah exactly you know what I'm saying so that's a whole different thing she that's part of her journey she chose to come over here so that's different so that's a come you won't see him come back but I do like that point you are right you will be robbing somebody else or something else and yeah. no matter what happens you can't fix it and that Gamora it's not like she had this family to mourn her leaving that reality too because the Guardians hadn't formed in that reality yet. So she didn't have people that she was close to. And even in, did you see Guardians? You saw Guardians 3, right? Yeah. And even in that one, I also, I don't think I ended up liking Guardians 3 as much as I necessarily wanted to or was expecting to, but I did like how Peter and Gamora didn't get back together. Because I kind of thought that like through somehow, like through Adam Warlock's powers, because in the comics, his powers are crazy. He has these crazy, crazy powers. Like, I thought he might give her back the memories of her soul from the 2018 version, and she'd remember and, like, fall in love with Peter again. And I, I kind of expected that. And I wasn't going to be mad at it if that did happen, if she got her memories back, or if she got back with Peter. But I feel like the fact that she didn't really stands out and really shows that, like, okay, something died. And to me, that also kills the whole, hey, with the multiverse theory, no one's really dead because you can just bring them in. And it's like, well, in this case, they brought in Gamora and parts of her. She's not as close to Nebula. She's and her romance with Peter died. You know, like <laughs> if they had gotten married and had kids, that's a potential child who will never be born because they are not together. And so I feel like seeing Peter having to go through that and accept it was a big character growth moment for him. And that's one of the decisions I really applauded in Guardians 3, not having them get back together i think worked very well yeah i like that too he needed to go ahead and go back home but i did think it was funny though when he looked at uh, uh the sister that way <laughs> he was like hey, oh yeah he's looking at oh, nebula it's like peter you're so Your lonely eyes are so dark i never know that dude that was so funny yeah and i think partly why i like um secret invasion too is because like a lot of people say like marvel there are two people there are two sides of each coin like some people really <laughs> like really like the self-contained storylines of marvel and to me, it's like, I like that, but like most movies that we see are self contained. They're just kind of in their own universe. The whole point of comics and comic book movies is the interconnection because everyone got really excited. They were reading Thor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, shoot, Thor's going to be an Avenger with Captain America. After I read Captain America 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, now I get to see them both in this crossover. Like, crossover elements was like a thing that drove comics and made them so cool. And some people think that, like, the MCU constantly trying to cross things over is, like, wearing down their movies. But I always love when there's elements of the MCU in each movie. And I feel like we, like, the last stories that we've gotten through most of Phase 4 have been very self-contained, not really connected to each other. Like, they're connected to the multiverse, to the universe, to the Marvel, you know, cinematic universe, to the Marvel cinematic universe, but they're not really connected to each other. But Secret Invasion, it feels like it's connected, even though that wasn't really Agent Ross, it feels like it was connected to Wakanda Forever, because we just saw Agent Ross in that. It feels like it was connected to WandaVision, 
It was connected to Captain Marvel. It was connected to Endgame. Like, it was connected. It felt like it was connected to a lot of projects that we had just seen. And I liked that. And that was cool. It felt like it was back to that Marvel element of being connected. Because to me, like, that's their strength. Like, again, people don't want to see it overdone. But that is what a lot of us are here for, for the interconnection. You just got to make sure you do it well. Definitely, definitely. I like that. I like that. But yeah, I do have to agree. That is one thing that they did do well, which is making sure everything tied in. Then I can't lie. I have to say, Marvel does a good job about that with so much, man. I think it's mm-hmm. one of the things I like about them. Some why it keeps me interested in the movies and TV shows. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think we've covered um, Secret Invasion pretty well. Um, like I said, it's only the first episode. It's hard when there's so many questions and so many things to go into. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say, I feel like this is definitely the right project for a TV show. I feel like a lot of um, Marvel's TV shows have kind of felt like mini movies or like they were trying to find a way to make it into a TV show. The elements of Secret Invasion, it feels like it does work as a TV show where you get revealed things slowly and slowly have to go through the story. And that makes sense. Like Loki, it made sense as a TV show. Even WandaVision felt like it made sense as a TV show at the beginning because it literally was a TV show. But sometimes it's like some of their other projects like Miss Marvel and Moon Knight and um, I'm trying to think of another one that's just even Hawkeye. Like they weren't bad, but it felt like they were trying to stretch out a story that could have been a movie. And it's like it didn't really feel like it was not like it feels like they were trying to take a movie and like break it up into a TV show instead of just making a TV show. Because I'm like, Miss Marvel easily could have been a movie. So could Moon Knight, and so could have Hawkeye, and so could have um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You know, it didn't really feel like this is a TV show. To me, Secret Invasion feels like a spy TV show. I have to agree with you 100%. I think that's one of the reasons why I can't wait to see what happens, man. Just because they actually caught the right feel with this one. So I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because Secret Invasion could have been a movie as well. But I do like it. Like I said, it fits. Spy things are very cool because they work. They translate easily from movie or TV show. I've seen spy shows and I've seen spy movies. Like either one, they all work. So, um, yeah, I guess um, anything else you want to tell the people, Brian, before we sign off? Nah, I just really appreciate you having me on, man. I can't wait to uh, invite you over to my side of the thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any channels for people to check out so that way they can find you as well? Well, if you want to, you can look at www.riseup.com. Uh, it's Rise Up TV on YouTube and Rise Up Magazine on all other social media. All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on the Blurred Wire today, Brian. And uh, hopefully we'll pick this back up. Definitely. I, anytime you want to have me back, I'll be here. Sounds like a plan. All right, guys. Let us know what you think in the uh, comments or down below what you think. Um, Secret Invasion is going to take it next and uh, until next time Blurts we'll see you again dude that was sweet